Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, and today we're going to be talking about why Frankfurt's second order desires do not allow for free will. Okay, before we do that, I just want to go briefly into why I'm doing the show and you just briefly define what we mean when we say causal will, free will, and causal will. Okay, basically, the idea is that um, our belief in free will. Um, it being an illusion, it not really being the, the way things are in reality, is, uh, is very problematic to, to our world, to our interactions both on a personal and global level. It, um, it leads to blame, it leads to accusations, it leads to conflict, to competition, to self-blame, um, leads to arrogance, to envy, you know. Um, it just like, it creates a lot of problems. And so the, the, the prediction, the, the hope, is that as we overcome this illusion, we will create a much more intelligent, uh, compassionate, and understanding world. Okay, um, so now the idea is when, when we, basically when we say that we have a free will, we would be saying that, um, that our decisions are completely up to us, that, you know, genetics, you know, cannot influence our behavior, um, our environment, what we learned in the past, what we didn't learn, that, none, that we have a way to override any and all of those influences, okay, and just make the decision completely on our own. And naturally, the, uh, the two answers to that that I think are, are the, um, the best refutations of it is that we have an unconscious where all of our memories are stored, okay, or all our data upon which we um, make our decisions. And that unconscious obviously is not in our control. You know, we're not, we're not even conscious of it. Um, it's also the, the part of our brain that, um, that actually has the processes by which we make a decision. Because, you know, you have to realize when we make a decision, we're not like thinking to ourselves, you know, well, why exactly did I make that? You know, what calculations did I use? This is all like automatic at the level of the unconscious. We're not aware of it. And so if you have both of these, both the data and the process for, for making decisions operating at the unconscious, then obviously that, um, that would... Um, make free will impossible. You know, you're, you're having our decisions made at certainly a, a level of our mind that we're not in control of, we're not even aware of. And the second reason, of course, that free will is impossible is that everything has a cause. So if we make a decision, there's a cause for that decision. Then there's a cause for that cause and a cause for that cause. And if you take that cause back through history, through, through the past, that, you know, it spans to before we were born. All right, so let's, let's begin with... with um, Frankfurt, Harry Frankfurt uh, is, um, I think he's a psychologist, he may be a philosopher also. Um, he, he made a claim that, you know, while the other animals have first order desires, um, human beings have second order desires also. And, and let me explain what, what he meant by that. Like, a first order desire is, I want something to eat. You know, I'm, I'm hungry, I want something to eat. Um, Okay, and he says, all right, both animals and human beings have that. Then he says, there are second-order desires. Let's say, let's say we're on a diet. Let's say we want to lose some weight. So a second-order desire is, you know, I want something to eat, but I want to not want something to eat. You know, it's a desire about a desire. Okay, so that's what, you know, and so like apparently Frankfurt is saying that because we have second-order desires, that somehow gives us a free will. Uh, there is no logic in that, but I, and we'll explain why. But that's his assertion. All right, but before we get into that, I want to I want to defend our animal friends because, like, you know, in history we've made these kind of like claims that animals don't feel that. Oh, you know, and actually, it's it's you know, it's not funny in the sense that we treat animals horribly because of this. You know, farm animals, lab animals. You know, we we. we um, we refuse to acknowledge, to admit to ourselves that they feel pain. I mean, they absolutely feel pain, and you know, oh, it's horrible. But anyway, um, in defense of animals, in, in this context, you know, I, I think I don't think there's ev evidence to claim that animals don't have second-order desires. For example, let's say you have a dog, okay, in an apartment, and the dog wants to go to the bathroom, okay. It wants to go to the bathroom, but there's nobody around, you know, to take it out for a walk. Now, the dog knows that, like, in the past, when it's, you know, gone to the bathroom on a carpet or something, it has gotten punished, okay? I mean, this is pretty, you know, this is like, 
I think everybody can relate to this, that a dog would, you know, would have that, that understanding. And so, like, naturally, the dog would probably very likely want to not want to go to the bathroom. You know, the dog is probably, you know, gee, I wish I didn't have to or didn't want to go to the bathroom because there's no, no possibility. So that, you know, that, that just um, kind of answers his, I, you know, I think, do I think animals, dogs clearly have um, these second order desires. But, um, but more to the point, okay. Now here's the thing. So let's say we, we've got a second order desire. We, we want to not want to eat or we want to not want to smoke or not want to whatever, okay? Where does that um, prohibit, um, where does that grant free will? Because like a want is a reason, you know, whether it's, whether it's a want, a direct want or a want about a want, <laughs> it's all causal. If it's, a, if it's a want about a want, like, you know, if I would want to not want to eat, that's still, you know, there's a reason for wanting that. You know, in this case, it would be like to lose weight or whatever. Um, but, and when, when you have a reason, you have a cause. <laughs> so again, the, the simple refutation to these Frankfurt-style second-order desire arguments for free will is like, no, they, they have causes that just because it's a second order desire in no way allows the decision to escape this chain of causality that governs everything. Okay, um, <clears throat> and so like, so you can understand, um, you can understand um, why these second order desires are not a, a credible, you know, um, demonstration of a free will from the perspective of causality and naturally um, the uh, perspective of the unconscious applies to this equally well. Um, that second order desire, that, that wanting to want or not want something, you know, that's, that's taking place at the level of the unconscious. It's, it's drawing from information. There has to be reasons why we don't want to want to do something or not want to do something. You know, there are reasons for that. And there was a reasoning process that, that came about. And again, if, if, if all our data, if all our memories, if all our information is in the unconscious, and the very process of our making decision is um, made at the uh, unconscious level, then you can, you can certainly understand um, how we, we have no control over the unconscious. You know, we just, um, the unconscious is, is a part of us that, you know, it certainly is a part of us. Nobody's disputing us that, but it's a part that we absolutely have no control over. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like if our hand was saying, well, I made this decision to put my hand there, where the reality is that, you know, the mind made the decision. You know, so, so our consciousness, what happens, really just, um, becomes aware, becomes aware of the decisions the unconscious makes and then claims credit for them and says, oh, I made this decision. And actually, there, there's a lot of experiments in science and psychology that demonstrate that, um, experiments in, in hypnosis where, um, where you have somebody hypnotized and they're given a, a post-hypnotic su suggestion to do something. And what happens, they, you know, they come out of the hypnosis, they... Um, they do the post-hypnotic suggestion and they're asked, well, why did you do that? And they'll have had no recognition or knowledge that the reason they did that was because of the post-hypnotic suggestion. They'll just make up a reason. You know, so, so the reality is that when our consciousness, you know, it could be actually in every case. I, I, I believe, you know, there's, there's evidence that in certainly many cases, the decision is made at the level of the unconscious. But I think probably more realistically every decision we make is made at the level of the unconscious because you know that's where all the data is that's where the decision making processes are and naturally since since we can't control the unconscious um, the you know the the decisions can't be freely made by our consciousness okay um, so Frankfurt had a few other claims that um, there that are a bit you know, difficult to, to understand in terms of how they would allow for free will. He claims that, that free will 
I mean, he, he gives a, a kind of like a, a curious definition of free will. He says, free will is having the will that we want. You know, in other words, if, if, if we, you know, if we can want what we want to want, <laughs> then that's free will. But, um, I mean, having what we want, and, you know, in other words, like, if we will something and it happens, that he, he says that that's free will. But that's, that's not free will. That's just luck. You know, if we have a will to, let's say, stop smoking or, or you know, do something to, you know, if we want something and we'd actually, you know, have it happen, then that's, you know, that is just, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate. We're fortunate. That, that in no way demonstrates that that want is, um, is freely willed. And, and, you know, when we consider the, um, the question in terms of wants, you know, wants is desires, we can understand why free will is impossible from that perspective because um, we're not really in control of our desires, you know, like whether we desire a certain kind of food, a certain kind of experience, a certain kind of music, clothing, whatever. You know, these are kind of like preferences that are, I mean, we, we are molded by our past to a certain extent in them, but then the other part is um, that a lot of them are genetic, you know, the kind of foods we like and all. But, so it's a, com but it's a combination of the genetics and our past experience. So we can't just, the, the point is we can't, at the moment we're um, making a decision, just, um, just choose our desires. They've been chosen for us by this causal process of, of genetics and past experience. Okay, um, so Frankfurt makes another kind of very curious assertion. He says some people are what he describes as wantons. And he says that um, these people don't have impulse control. They, you know, they can't control their impulses, so they naturally don't have a free will. And, you know, he, I guess, in, you know, he's right about that. I mean, if because we all have impulses, and uh, to the extent that we can't control them, that naturally demonstrates that, you know, the impulses are, are controlling us and, and not our, our quote-unquote free will. But, um, but then, you know, he claims that those of us who, who can control our, in, our, our impulses have a free will. So why does that not make sense? Because, let's, you know, so let's say we, can, we control an impulse. Why do we do that? There's a reason for that. You know, and once we have a reason for doing something, we have a cause for doing something. And naturally, that cause has a cause, and that cause has a cause, and you have this causal regression leading to before we were born. Um, so, and the other part again, you know, anytime there's a question, this is the key. Anytime there is a question to, um, about why we do anything, you know, any, anytime there's um, an assertion that we have a free will, the refutation is always the same. You know, it's always going to be the same. For example, if, you know, um, one plus one is always going to equal two, that's going to be the answer to, you know, however, whether the ones are in Roman numerals or Chinese or whatever, you know, there's always, it's always the same answer. So with this answer of like, you know, any claim to a free will, there are two answers. The first is causality, that if, if, if a decision, you know, to control our impulse in this case, you know, has a reason, that reason is a cause, and causality is the reason why the, the decision is not freely willed. And the other one is the unconscious. You know, if, if we have, you know, if we're drawing, um, when we think, okay, pre-language, I'm not really sure how infants pre-language think. I mean, I don't remember. <laughs> but, um, but generally, um, you know, we, we tend to think, somewhat linguistically. Some, some of us think more in terms of imagery, whatever, but our, our, you know, our thinking involves like the memory of concepts, table, chair, you know, these are stored in our memory. And, and in order to, to make a decision about whatever, we have to consider it. You know, we have to consider it, so we have to draw on that information. Now, naturally, if that information is not consciously available to us, because for it to, ha to be consciously available, we would have to be aware at the present moment of every word, every memory that we've ever had. So naturally, that's impossible. It's stored in the part of our, our brain that's completely unconscious, um, completely not in our control. 
And, and a reason, you know, one way you can understand that it's not in our control is like, for example, the reason why we have to study to take tests. If we had a free will, we could just commit something to memory and when the test, you know, came about, just write it out, you know, without, um, without any kind of hesitation because we could freely just draw from our, our memory bank. Obviously, um, very few people can do that to any substantial degree, and even they, you know, at a certain point, you know, it's basically their unconscious um, allows them to, to draw that information. All right, but the idea is, yeah, you have the unconscious that not, no, not only stores the data on which we're making these decisions, impulse control or whatever, but the very decision-making processes. You know, why are we deciding um, one way or against, uh, rather than the other? Is it, is it a moral decision? Is it a hedonic decision? Is it a rational decision? You know, these are all, you know, these are all considerations that are, that are taking place at an con unconscious level. We don't, you know, we obviously don't go through this entire process of, you know, why we're making this decision when we think. You know, that's, that's actually what the, um, the idea of a gut feeling is about. You know, we kind of like, you know, somebody asks us something and um, we come up with an answer. It's like, you know, it's like we wait for the answer to come to us. Okay? Okay. So, um, and yeah, let's just briefly discuss the, uh, <coughs> the notion of second order desires from the standpoint of desires. Um, yeah, desires are conditioned to a great extent. Um, the foods we, we um, prefer, in other countries, they prefer much different foods. And naturally, you know, um, it's something that starts very early. You're conditioned to like something or not. Now, s sometimes even at a very early age, you know, you, you find mothers try to get kids to eat spinach or some other foods and it doesn't always work. So, um, so at, at, at some point, sometimes these desires are actually genetic. Um, the strongest desire, actually, that, that probably that is responsible for all our decisions, including moral decisions, um, is the hedonic desire, the desire to seek pleasure or avoid pain. You know, that we're hardwired for that. All, all organisms are, are hardwired for that. And so if you have that desire driving your every decision, including impulse control, including any kind of second order desire, for example, a second order desire to want to stop eating, whatever. Why would you want to do that? You want to do that to be more healthy, to be more happy, whatever. You know, to um, any, any, any time we want to not want a desire or to, to want something, there, there is a hedonic related reason for that. There's a reason that relates to our well-being that we predict that, you know, if we don't want to want a certain thing or don't want to not want a certain thing, then that's going to make our life better or the life of those around us better. So, so that's a good way to, um, to understand um, why, why desires, you know, just basically um, are one one, um, or why, why, I'm sorry, the hedonic uh, imperative of, of always seeking pleasure and avoiding pain is, is a great way to understand why we don't have a free will, because if all of our decisions are based on that, obviously um, we can't uh, have a free will. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I've run out of material. <laughs> well, wait a minute, no. Um, Okay, um, I got to get this in because I forgot last episode, right? These shows are on the internet, okay? If you go to uh, causalconsciousness.com or if you Google Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. Now, also, if you Google Exploring the Illusion of Free Will, put it in quotation marks. I mean, I, I don't think you have to, have to do absolutely. But the other thing is, like, there is a little um, option on the top left that says video. Click on that, okay? Then there's another option in terms of like the time limits, like zero to four minutes for certain clips, or four to 20 minutes, or 20 minutes and above. If you click the four to 20 minute mark, you'll get these episodes. Um, not only will you get these episodes a half of them at a time, because like um, YouTube only allows, I think, um, well, yeah, most people to, to upload um, no more than 20 minutes. So I just basically split these um, 
or 15 minutes, I think. I basically split these um, episodes in half for that. But if you, again, if you go to causalconsciousness.com, then you can see the entire episode um, hosted through a, um, an internet service called Blip TV that distributes the show, you know, through various internet um, kind of portals. Okay, so um, that's good. And um, so, yeah, I'm going to like, I'm going to go through just some miscellaneous considerations um, related to this issue of, of free will. Now, we, we generally talk about how our wills are completely determined, you know, by causality, how, how the, the past moment completely determines our, our present, our will. But we have to remember that everything, everything is completely causal. You know, you go outside, you see that the car is moving, the people moving, you know, the birds flying. Everything is happening, happening in a predetermined cause away so the idea is like i mean this this is like it's surreal the the idea behind this is that we are actually um we're taking part in a movie reality the world is a movie and and like you know all right it's 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 more so than that because generally with a movie you're, you're an actor okay so we're actors in this movie but generally in a movie you get to interpret your role you know you get some decision making process in terms of like how you're going to play your role how you're going to portray your character and all but in this movie called reality called our universe uh we don't even get that you know our every you know our every reaction to everything is predetermined and again everything that happens um you know, and, and th what I'm saying is like, you know, it's not just human behavior that's, um, that's causal. It's not just animal behavior. It's, it's, it's the, the, the sun, it's the, the rain, the nature, you know, everything that's happening, it's just like, it's like, it's predetermined. It's pre, um, I'm not going to say predestined because that relates to a certain kind of like a, a concept, a Calvinist concept of, of, you know, some people being, you know, destined for a better place or a worse place in the afterlife, whatever. But, but predetermined in the sense that it's everything that's happening at this very moment in time is predetermined by the past. You know, this cause and effect way that the past moves into the present. All right, so, so the, the, the idea behind this is we're, we're spectators. <laughs> we're not the actors, really. We're watching we're experiencing. We experience reality. And you, you want to know something from a religious perspective? Um, you know, if you want to, like, bring, let's say, God into whatever, it's a kind of more, it's a, it's a real, or I mean, like, to, the believe, to believe that we have a free will, it's kind of like asserting that we're, like, many gods, that we're actually creating decisions, where, like, if, if we want to believe in a God that is all-powerful, you know, I mean, all-powerful means that, God's decision goes. So the idea behind that is like, basically our actions are expressing God's will. We're the instruments of God. And that, I think, to a lot of people, makes a lot more sense, feels a lot better than describing us as some of the, like, philosophers will describe us as robots, and I'll do this sometimes, I guess, because, you know, as programmed, you know, it's like a computer's programmed to do a certain thing, you know, certain tasks, and it has no choice but to do that. And so when I mean, we can describe ourselves in our, that sense, but, you know, that's kind of like impersonal. If, you know, if we were, I, I believe in God, you know, so like to retain our belief in God um, and, and understand our lack of free will within that context, so it's really, okay, um, God is omniscient, or no, God is omnipresent, meaning God is everywhere. So if God is everywhere, we are a part of God, okay? We're all, everything is a part of God. There isn't anything that exists that isn't a part of God because like, well, you know, logically, if God created everything, he had to have created it from himself, herself, whatever. So from that standpoint, it's like, we're the hands of God, we're the instruments of God, um, we are, we're not the decision-making part of God. Obviously, there's a part of, of reality that you could define either as the causal past or God. I think that it's, it's probably more precisely defined as the, the causal past because, um, you know, I've got, I've got to do a show on this, but the idea is like, the question is, well, does God have free will? Uh, can God break this law of causality? And I'm not sure he, he can. I, I, I would hope that he can't. 
because uh, with my conception of God, I, I like to um, believe in a, a, a good, loving God. Now, obviously, it doesn't make sense because there are so many, like, not so good, uh, unloving things in the world. But to the extent that I ascribe a free will to God, then I have to hold him responsible for that. Whereas if I say, well, God is compelled in whatever way um, God acts, then that allows me to, to, um, to hold God innocent also. You know, just as, you know, because the idea is like when we, when we believe, when we, you know, fall for the notion that we have a free will, we will hold ourselves responsible. We'll, we'll indict ourselves. We'll convict ourselves, punish ourselves and each other. Uh, when we hold ourselves as innocent, we're, we're much more understanding. Okay. Um, some people say that, well, if we abandon this illusion of free will, everybody's going to just do whatever they want because they're going to say, well, you know, you can't blame me. It's just, you know, I'm programmed, you know, blame the universe. But the reason we wouldn't let that happen is because we're like hardwired, programmed to be hedonic creatures. We're going to seek pleasure and avoid pain, meaning if somebody's going around doing something that is not, um, you know, good for us, for them, we're going to take steps to, um, to not allow that. Now, naturally, from the perspective of knowing that the person who does those things had absolutely no control over it, you know, we're going to be far more understanding, and that's the point. You know, but, but we will naturally do whatever we have to do to maintain order, maintain civilization, and all that. Okay, well, um, I hope you, you understand why the Frankfurt, you know, second order desires argument for free will just doesn't make sense. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to explore just this whole topic in, in many, many other ways. So I guess I'll see you on future shows.